It will be cumbrous to give a detailed consecutive account for our wanderings inside the carnivorous, eon-dead honeycomb of primal masonry. That monstrous layer of elder secrets which now echoed for the first time after uncounted epochs to the tread of human feet. This is especially true because so much of horrible drama and revelation came from the mere study of the omnipresent mural carvings. Our flashlight photographs of those carvings will do much towards proving the truth of what we are now disclosing, and is lamentable that we had not a larger film supply with us. As it was, we made crude notebook sketches of certain salient features after all our films were used up. The building which we had entered was one of great size and elaborateness. It gave us an impressive notion of the architecture of the nameless geological past. The inner partitions were less massive than the outer walls, but the lower levels were excellently preserved. Labyrinthine complexity, involving curiously irregular differences in floor levels, characterised the entire arrangement, and we should certainly have been lost at the very outset but for the trail of torn paper left behind us. We decided to explore the more decrepit upper parts first of all, hence climbed aloft in a maze of distance of some 100 feet, to where the topmost tier of the chambers yawned snowily and ruinously open to the polar sky. Ascent was effected over the steep, transversely ribbed stone ramps or inclined planes which everywhere served in lieu of stairs. The rooms were encountered of all imaginable shapes and proportions, ranging from five-pointed stars to triangles to perfect cubes. It might be safe to say that the general average was about 30 by 30 feet in floor area, or 20 feet in height, though many larger apartments existed. After roughly examining the upper regions of the glacial levels, we descended story by story into the submerged part, where indeed we soon saw we were in the continuous maze of connected chambers and passages, probably leading over unlimited areas outside the particular building. The cyclopean massiveness and giganticism of everything about us became curiously oppressive, and there was something vaguely but deeply unhuman about the contours, dimensions, proportions, decorations, and constructual nuances of the blasphemy Antarctic stonework. We soon realised that the carvings revealed of this monstrous city was many million years old. We cannot yet explain the engineering principles used in the anomalous balancing and adjusting of the vast rock masses, though the function of each arc was clearly much relied on. The rooms we visited were wholly burr of all portable contents and circumstance which sustained our belief in the city's deliberate desertion. The prime decorative feature was almost universal system of mural sculpture, which tended to run in continuous horizontal bands three feet wide and arranged from floor to ceiling in alternation with bands of equal width given over the geometrical arabesques. There were exceptions to this rule of arrangement, but its preponderance was overwhelming. Often, however, a series of smooth cartouches contained oddly patterned groups of dots which would be sunk along one of the arabesque bands. The technique, we soon saw, was mature, accomplished, and aesthetically evolved to the highest degree of civilised mastery, though utterly alien in every detail to any known art tradition of the human race. In delicacy of execution, no sculpture I have ever seen could approach it. The minutest details of elaborate vegetation or of animal life were rendered with astonishing vividness, despite the bold scale of the carvings, whilst the conventional designs were marvels of skilful intricacy. The arabesques displayed a profound use of mathematical principles, and were made up of obscurely symmetrical curves and angles based on the quantity of five. The pictorial bands followed a highly formalised tradition, and involved a peculiar treatment of perspective but had an artistic force that moved us profoundly, notwithstanding the intervening gulf of the vast geological periods. Their method of design hinged on a singular juxtaposition of the cross-section with two-dimensional silhouette, and embodied an analytical psychology beyond that of any known race of antiquity. It is useless to try to compare this art with any represented in our museums. Those who see our photographs will probably find it closest analogue in certain grotesque conceptions of the most durin futurists. 
the arabesque tracery consisted together of depressed lines, of whose depths were on withered walls varied from one to two inches. The cartouches along dotted groups appeared evidently as inscriptions in some unknown or primordial language and alphabet. The depressions of the smooth surface were perhaps an inch and a half, and the dots perhaps a half an inch more. The pictorial bands were in the countersunk low relief, their background being depressed about two inches from the original wall surface, in some specimens mark of a former coloration that could be detected, though for the most part the untold aeons had disintegrated and banished any pigments which may have been applied. The more one studied the marvellous technique, the more one admired the things. Beneath their strict conventionalization, one could grasp the minute and accurate observation and graphic skill of the artists, and indeed the very conventions themselves served to symbolize the accurate and real essence or vital differentiation of every object delineated. We felt too that, beside the recognizable excellences, there were others lurking beyond the reach of our perceptions. Certain touches, here and there, give vague hints of latent symbols and stimuli, which another mental and emotional background, and a fuller or different sensory equipment, might have made of profound and pignant significant to us. The subject matter of the sculptures obviously came from the life of the vanquished epoch of their creation. They contained a large proportion of evident history. It is this abnormal historic mindness that the primal race, a chance circumstance operating, through coincidence, miraculously in our favour, which made the carving so awesomely informative to us, and which caused us to place their photography and transcription above all other considerations. In certain rooms the dominant arrangement was varied by the presence of maps, astronomical charts and other scientific designs on an enlarged scale. These things given a naive and terrible corroboration of what we gathered from the pictorial frenzies and dadods. In hinting at what the whole revealed, I can only hope that my account will not arouse a curiosity greater than sea and caution on the part of those who believe me at all. It would be tragic if anyone were to be allured to that realm of death and horror by the very warning meant to discourage them. Interrupting these sculptured walls were high windows and massive twelve-foot doorways, both now and then retaining to their petrified and wooden planks, elaborately carved and polished, of the actual shutters and doors. All metal fixtures had long ago vanished, but some of the doors remained in place and had to be forced aside as we progressed from room to room. Window frames with odd transparent panes, mostly elliptical, survived here and there, though in no considerable quantity. There were also frequent niches of greater mag magnitude, generally empty but once in a while containing some bizarre object carved from green soapstone which was either broken or perhaps held too inferior to warrant removal. Other apertures were undoubtedly connected with bygone mechanical facilities, heating, lighting and the like, of sort of suggestion that many of the carvings. Ceilings tended to be plain, but had sometimes been inlaid with green soapstone or other tiles, mostly fallen now. Floors were also paved with such tiles, though plain stonework predominated. As I have said, all furniture and other movables were absent but the sculptures give a clear idea of the strange devices which had once filled these tomb-like echoing rooms. Above the glacial sheet the floors were generally thick with detritus, litter and debris, and further down this condition decreased. In some of the lower chambers and corridors there was little more than gritty dust or ancient encrustations, while occasional areas had an uncanny air of newly swept immaculateness. Of course, there were rifts or collapsed had occurred. The lower levels were as littered as the upper ones. A central court, as in the other structures we had seen from the Ur, served as inner regions from total darkness, and that we seldom had to use our electric torches in the upper rooms except when studied the sculptured details. Below the ice cap, however, the twilight deepened, and in many parts of the tangled ground level, there was an approaching and absolute blackness. 
to form an even rudimentary idea of our thoughts and feelings as we penetrated the eon-silent maze of unhuman masonry, one must correlate a hopelessly bewildering chaos of fugitive modes, memories and impressions. The sheer appalling antiquity and lethal desolation of the place was enough to overwhelm almost any sensitive person, and added to the elements were recent unexpected horror at the camp and the revelations of too soon affected by the terrible mural sculptures around us. The moment we came upon a perfect section of Carvin where no ambiguity or interpretation could exist, it took only a brief study to give us the hideous truth, a truth which it would be naive to claim Danforth and I had no independently suspected before, though we had carefully refrained from even hinting it to each other. There could now be no further merciful doubt about the nature of the beings which had built the inhabited and monstrous dead city millions of years ago, when man's ancestors were primitive mammals and the vast dinosaurs roamed the tropical steppes of Europe and Asia. We had previously clung to the desperate alternative, and insisted, each to himself, that the omnipresent of the five-pointed motif meant only some cultural or religious exaltation of the Archean natural object, which had so patently embodied the equality of the five-pointedness. As the decorative motifs of the Minoan crate exalted the sacred bull, those of Egypt the Scarabaeus, and those of Rome the wolf and the eagle, and those of various savage tribes, some chosen totem animals, but for the lone refuge was now stripped from us, and we were forced to face definitely the reason shaken realisation, of which the reader of those pages had doubtless long ago anticipated. We can scarcely bear to write it down in the black and white even now, but perhaps that will not be necessary. The things once rearing and dwelling in this frightful masonry of the age of dinosaurs was not indeed dinosaurs, but far worse. Mere dinosaurs were new and almost brainless objects, but the builders of the city were wise and old, and had left certain traces in rocks even that had laid down weighed nigh a thousand million years, rocks laid down before true life on earth had advanced beyond plastic groups of cells, rocks laid down before the true life of earth had existed at all. There were marks and enslavers of that life, and beyond any doubt, the originals are the fiendish elder myths of things like the Nucotic manuscripts of the Necronomicon are frighteningly hinted about. They were the great old ones that had filtered down from the stars when Earth was young, and the beings whose substance an alien evolution had shaped, and whose powers were such as this planet had never bred. And to think about that only the day before Danforth and I had actually looked upon the fragments of their millennially fossilised substance and that of Pearl Lake and his party had seen the complete outlines. It is, of course, impossible for me to relate the proper order in the stages of which we picked up what we know from the monstrous chapter of pre-human life. After the first shock of the certain revelation, we had to pause for a while to recuperate, and it was fully three o'clock before we got started on our actual tour of the systematic research. The sculptures in the building we entered were of relatively late date, perhaps two million years ago, as checked on the geological, biological and astronomical features, and embodied an art which could be called the descendant in comparison of that specimens we found in the older buildings after crossing bridges under the glacial sheet. One edifice, hawn from the solid rock, seemed to go back forty or possibly fifty million years, to the lower Eocene or Upper Cretaceous, and contained bas-reliefs of an artistry suppressing anything else, to one tremendous exception that we encountered. That was, we have since agreed, the oldest domestic structure we have traversed. Were it not for the support of those flashlights soon to be made public, I would refrain from telling what I found and inferred, lest I be confined as a madman. Of course, the infinitely early parts of the patchwork tale, representing those pre-terrestrial life of the star-headed beings from other planets, on the other galaxies and other universes, can readily be interrupted as fantastic mythology of those beings themselves. Yet such parts sometimes involve designs and diagrams so uncannily close to the latest findings of mathematics and astrophysics that I scarcely know what to think that others judge when they see the photographs that I shall publish. Naturally, 
No one set of carvings which we encountered told more than a fracture of any connected story, nor did we even begin to come upon the various stages of that story in their proper order. Some of the vast rooms were independent units so far as their designs were concerned, whilst in other cases continuous chronicle and would be carried through the series of rooms and corridors. The best of the maps and diagrams were on the walls of the frightful abyss, below even the ancient ground level. A cavern, perhaps 200 feet square and 60 feet high, which had almost undoubtedly been an educational centre of some sort. There were many provoking repetitions of the same material in different rooms and buildings. Since certain chapters of experience and certain summaries or phrases of racial history had evidently been favourites with different decorators or dwellers, sometimes, though, variant versions of the same theme provided useful and certain debatable points of filling in the gaps. I still wonder what we had deduced in such a short time of our disposal. Of course, we even now have the same burst outlines of much of that we obtained later from the study of the photographs and sketches we made. It may be the effect of this later study, the revived memories of the vague impressions acting in conjunction with his general sensitiveness, and that the final supposed horror glimpse of whose essence he will not reveal even to me which has been the immediate source of Danforth's present breakdown. It had to be, we could not ensure our warning intelligently without the fullest possible information, and the insurance of that warning is a prime necessity. Certain lingering influences in that unknown Antarctic world of disordered time and alien and natural law make it imperative that the further exploration be discouraged. <laughs>